Hello and welcome back to CS128 Honors. In this lesson video, we're going to talk about types in Rust. So in CS124 or AP Computer Science, you're told about types. And some examples of those include int, string, char, and double. And all of these types are basically different ways to store data. And you might be wondering at this point, why are we talking about types again? And to explain why, let's take a look at how these variables are actually stored in memory. So looking at our abstract representation of computer memory, you can see here that we have x and we've declared it to be an int and that's a certain amount of binary storage. Now what's important here is that the computer, had we not told it that x is an int, doesn't know how to read those zeros and ones, right? It could be that x being an int, it's whatever that number comes out to be, or it could be being a string, it's a completely different string as opposed to a number, right? This binary data is potentially many different things at once and we need to give it a type to make sure that we know which thing that we're talking about. And what's nice about Rust is that the compiler is able to do this for us. And it's able to infer what type of variable is simply by the constant that you use to initialize it. So in Rust, scalar types represent a singular value. This is like a primitive type in Java or C++. And Rust has four primary scalar types integers, floating point numbers, which are doubles or floats in other languages, booleans, and then characters. And we're gonna do a deep dive into each one of these right now. So looking at integers, let's first off have a refresher and remember that integers are numbers that have no decimal places. They're as simple as that. They can be one, two, three, four, five, whatever. So in Rust, there are many different types of integers, right? You can see this big table, all of these are types of integers. And so they're split into different categories, signed and unsigned, as well as 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, and so on. And so that means that they're different sizes, as well as they can either be signed or unsigned. So let's talk about what that means specifically. So with integers, the size corresponds to how many bits, binary digits, are being used to store these integers, right? So for example, in this abstract memory, we have an i8, which is an 8-bit integer, right? And now, let's say instead we want a 16-bit integer. And so now it will have 16 ones and zeros all together representing this integer. But we can go even bigger and have something as large as 32 bits or 64 or even 128 bits long. And all of these are just different ways to represent integers using binary. And so just whenever you see these numbers, just think that that is the number of binary ones and zeros that are being used to store these bits. So then we also have the question of what does signed versus unsigned mean? Well, signed versus unsigned means the signed integers have one bit reserved for whether it's positive or negative. And the rest of the integer is used to determine the size of that integer. Whereas with an unsigned integer, it can be twice as large on the positive end of a signed integer, but it cannot go into the negatives. So this is really useful if say you have something like the size of an array, you can use a signed integer as opposed to an unsigned integer because that way you're able to store it for twice as large of an array. Now keep in mind that these are both just different ways of reading the exact same data. So if we look at this example, even though it's the same binary pattern, the signed integer is read as negative 108, whereas the unsigned integer is 148, because in reality, all we're doing is we're deciding which one is negative and which one is positive. So we have one final thing to talk about with Rust integers, and that is the arch type. The arch type is a type that depends on the architecture type of your machine. So there are two types. There are I sizes and U sizes. And as you can imagine, that is either a uh, signed integer or an unsigned integer of a size based on your machine. And there are usually two types for most major computers nowadays. 32-bit architecture, which is for older computers, which has 32 bits for each integer, or 64-bit architectures, which will have 64 bits for each integer. Now, these basically just mean that the faster computers can store more data and work with larger integers, but the 32-bit can still work with I64 or I128. It just means that it's going to be slower than if you were to use an I size or a U size.
So let's take a look at a few examples of integers. So the first example that we have is an 8-bit integer that's unsigned, which means it can go all the way up to 255 from zero, and it will be able to store that just fine. Then the next example we have is a signed 16-bit integer, which we're using to store 196. Now, right here you can see we're using an I16, which means that it is a signed 16-bit integer. And then finally, we have an architecture size, which is an I size in this case, which means that it's a signed 64-bit integer, at least on my computer. And as you can see, we're able to store very large numbers in there because 64-bit ints are very large in size. So the next type that we're going to talk about is floats. And floats in Rust, similar to other languages, store integers but also decimal points. So you're able to have, say, a value of 3.25, right? And in Rust, there are two types of floats. There's F32 and F64, which, as you may imagine, corresponds to which amount of bits that you're using to store these floats in. And the default on uh, most computers is F64, since for most CPUs, it's the same speed, but it's also much more precise except for 32-bit computers, which still rely on using 32-bit computations. And similarly to integers, the number is based on the number of bits the variable stores. So the next type that we're going to talk about in Rust is Booleans. And similarly to other languages, Booleans store a value of either true or false. It can only be one of those two and nothing more, nothing less. Now, interestingly, and this is something that you'll see in most low-level languages, you'll start to notice that actually Booleans take up one full byte, or eight bits, in size, despite the fact that they only need one bit to, turn, to determine whether it's true or false. Now, the reason of this is because of the way that computer architecture works, which you'll learn more about in CS233, but I thought that was an interesting thing to keep in mind just as you're going along. And to declare Booleans, to implicitly type, all you do is say let variable name equal to true or false, and then for explicitly typed, you can add the colon and then bool, so that Rust knows for sure that you mean to have a boolean type there. So the next type that we're going to talk about are characters. And characters are used to store letters and are the underlying basis that strings are built upon in Rust, just like in any other language. Now, importantly, in Rust, characters are actually four times the size as they would be in C++, at four bytes large versus one byte in C++. But we'll get to why that is in a moment. However, one thing to note is that characters are defined using single quotes, whereas double quotes automatically infer that you mean a string. Now, the reason that Rust is four bytes large is that it uses Unicode scalar values instead of just ASCII, which means that it can support a wide variety of things, not just American text, but also other languages, as well as emojis. Rust is able to fully support emojis because of the fact that it adopts Unicode. And as you can see, we can just declare a character by putting let and then a name equal to single quote and then an emoji or any other character that you want to use. So finally, we're going to talk about strings. And while strings aren't a scalar type, we still feel they're very important. So that's why we're throwing them into this lesson. So strings are used to represent groups of characters, right? And they're defined using double quotes, whereas the single quotes are used for characters. And so strings aren't a scalar type, but since we're going to be needing them in the rest of our Rust lessons and everywhere else, we're teaching them to you now. And to declare one, all you have to do is say let and then the variable name equal to and use those double quotes that I mentioned before. So in summary, in this lesson we talked about scalar types, including integers, floats, booleans, and characters, and how each of those works with Rust and why they're separate. Then we also talked about one non-scalar type, which is strings, because we think that it's relatively important that you learn about strings. I hope you enjoyed that CS128 honors lesson. In the next lesson, we'll be talking about the control flow for Rust. I hope to see you then.